so much. It's good to see everyone, and I wanted to invite two very um, esteemed marketers up to the stage. I think these guys are going to provide a great conversation for everyone today, not only because they are experts in their field, but also um, two gentlemen that I really respect. So I'd like to invite Mike Amsel, who's the VP of Growth at Sirius and Pandora, and then Sean Lewis, who heads up the partner program at Oracle Data Cloud. So come join me. So before we get into kind of brass tacks with this very, um, uh, very timely topic today, I thought it would be good just for you guys to introduce yourselves a little bit more, tell everyone a little bit more about your background. I think uh, Mike, you've been in marketing for over 15 years, you've had a breadth of experience, um, so I'd love to get a little more information about you, and then Sean will hear more about you. You've had kind of a more circuitous path yep. um, in a lot of different areas, including documentary production. Yes, right? yeah, roundabout way to get into marketing. So, Mike, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, cool. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Um, so, it's great to be here. Uh, my, my history is really around customer acquisition. So, how do we go and invest in digital channels to find user growth and positive margins of return? Um, I've been doing it through several companies now. I uh, recently joined Pandora about a year ago, and then Pandora recently was acquired by Sirius XM in about uh, 90 days. Um, with that acquisition, we're actually unifying our growth team across Pandora and Sirius to find the most efficient ways to find customers. Cool. Yeah, and then, as Kerry mentioned, I started off in documentary film production out of college. Um, so not the most intuitive path to get to marketing. Uh, but from there, moved into an agency role at Performix and was actually on the keyboard buying media. Um, and then from there, went into Kenshu on more of the ad tech SaaS side, and then was really interested in data, and then has since come over to the Oracle Data Cloud um, and worked on our partnerships team here for the past three years. Awesome. And just, I guess, a little context is only fair to share about who I am and my path, too. So I'm a co-founder at Social Code, so I've been there since the very early days and actually have my roots starting at an ad agency worked um, on the on the publishing side for the Washington Post and Slate, um, and then started to kind of think about technology in a way of how does it impact communications in society. So how little stint at the Aspen Institute as well. So this topic is super exciting to me. Um, actually, wrote my master's thesis on privacy in the digital world. <laughs> so, so so very related topic. So I'm excited to get into it with, with you guys and hear your opinion. So just to kind of set some context for everyone. I'm sure that unless um, most of you have been living under a rock recently, it's no big surprise that um, you know there's been a very big shift in the ecosystem. And you know, as, as mentioned at the sort of start of the panel, consumer trust is kind of at an all-time low as far as thinking about brands and how they're handling their customer data. And it was just over about a year ago um, that there was really that kind of big um, impetus that kicked everything off into like really making public awareness just um, spread quite quickly. And it was, you know, as, as you all know with Cambridge Analytica, sort of the scandal um, with this political consulting firm who was able to um, kind of get access to customer data from Facebook. And it, it, you know, without, you know, it just asking, you know, it sort of opened up a lot of questions and all of a sudden, you know, not only marketers were asking questions about, oh wait, like how are, you know, how are these, you know, these digital platforms that I rely on, how are they um, managing my data, but also like individual customers. We also hear a lot about data hacks with these major brands. Um, so it can be it can be a little bit intimidating sometimes, but, but also we know that data is kind of the most valuable marketing asset you can have too. So where I'd like to kind of start is thinking about, you know, there's, you know, this also kicked off sort of a lot of discussion about regulation. So with GDPR in Europe and then even here with the California Consumer Privacy Act that I think goes into effect this January, um, there's a lot of changes. And I think one of the places I'd love to start is just thinking back to a year ago for Michael Chan, like what was the most immediate impact that you that you saw? So I think Mike thinking about on the marketer side, what was the reaction for marketers? And then Sean, obviously, coming from a data solutions provider, I'm sure that had a great impact on your business as well. Uh, yeah, from the advertising perspective, uh, to think back a year ago, there's a lot of mythical data that we never really understood. Um, nothing is ever too good to be true in digital marketing. I feel like when you look at your performance and you can't explain what's happening, it's normally coming from something that actually is either 
wrong or not transparent. Uh, and so uh, the data sources, and even the, the request that we get to have testers of, hey, we have this new data source, can you use it? All that's faded away, and now a lot of our focus and that focus is around. So now we're understanding the data source is performing, like relationships, first party, to the other companies. Yeah, and, and from the ODC perspective, I actually covered the Facebook partnership. So Facebook was my client when this happened. Um, so my day-to-day -day changed drastically. <laughs> <laughs> So it went from really uh, working. Is that what happened to your shoulder? <laughs> yeah, this, this injury was a Facebook it data is new standard. <laughs> um, I was actually swimming, which might be more pathetic. But um, so, uh, in terms of working with Facebook, we used to send our audiences directly into Facebook's platform. There, there were partner categories in there, um, and Oracle Data Cloud has a ton of offline uh, transaction audiences that we send into publishers. So some of our data providers would be. Visa, MasterCard, and we send those audiences into publishers. Um, so we were historically, from since 2012, sending audiences into Facebook, and they were publicly available off their shelf. Any advertiser could go in and use these audiences for ad targeting. Um, and then in the wake of Cambridge Analytica, they deprecated their partner category program. Um, and so that, that kind of massive shift uh, that that caused, at least from our day to day, is that we had to go identify new partners in the ecosystem. So we started partnering with agencies, API partners, such as Social Code, um, in terms of uh, enabling our data to, to these partners that want to activate media um, and, and allowing them to, to activate the audiences back into Facebook. Um, so really kind of the shift was more so, uh, it's, it's a simple shift from the Facebook standpoint of, the, of in reaction to Cambridge Analytica, uh, they wanted to provide more transparency around how audiences were created and how ads were targeted. Um, as part of that, they wanted more transparency in the, in the data curation process, which is where we play a role, um, and, and forced us to work directly with advertisers, agencies, and API partners to set up those relationships and explain how, how we do what we do. Do you feel that the data providers were sort of unfairly scapegoated in some respects, or do you feel like it, you know, what was your kind of perception of how this was PR rolled out? Yeah, um, so I, I initially I felt empathetic towards Facebook because um, like they, every day they're in the media for some other data breach. Um, some of it is their fault, uh, others not. Um, and, and really kind of, I, I understood why they made the decision that they made uh, in really kind of stepping away from being a, a reseller of data and allowing us to transact directly with agencies and advertisers. So while it was harmful, at least in the short term, to our business, and then we had to reset up this whole, basically relaunch an audience product with agencies, API partners, um, I understood why they did it, and it, it, like I, I, I would say it wouldn't hold them at fault, and, and in their shoes, I probably would have made the same decision to distance yourself from data, distance yourself from that transaction, given all of the bad PR that they're under, that they're facing right now. Um, so I think kind of short answer is, is I understand the decision, um, albeit uh, disruptive to our day today. Got it. And so if we flash forward to present day, so it's been just a little bit over a year since um, a lot of these changes started to roll out. With hindsight being 2020, obviously there were, this was a big disruption at the time. Um, do you think, Mike, what do you think customers are feeling? Do you, do you think that they feel more secure with what's going on? Are they even more anxious? Do they feel like, you know, you know, I sort of, we have this hypothesis that as long as, you know, marketers are providing value to consumers in, in the form of whether it's more personalized communications or advertisements or whether it's getting a specialty, special coupon or award, there seems to be sort of a value exchange that is acceptable to consumers and in many cases appreciate it. But what you know, hindsight 2020 was was it as big of a deal as we all thought it was, or, or has everything kind of evened out and business as usual? Yeah, I think um, the, the consumers weren't necessarily thinking about privacy as a big deal, and now they are. And now that there's a spotlight on, I sign in with Facebook everywhere. How does that work? Or I sign up for the service and I check the terms and conditions. What does that mean? I think consumers understand that now, and they're more protective of if they are going to make an investment of their personal information, of email and their name or any other uh, fields they provide, they're going to want a service. And then we talk a lot about like how do you provide utility off of that experience. Um, and so from a Pandora perspective, 
we allow you, we don't resell our data, but when users sign up, we do see that there is a concern of how are you going to use my data and how do I get ads. You even hear the narrative of, I don't know how Instagram's targeting me, but they always hear me talking and they serve the, the product. They're doing lookalikes and other things. Uh, so consumers are conscious of that. I think as marketers, eventually we're going to need to surface how we're getting that information to consumers in a clear manner that doesn't freak them out and let them know that there's a service that they value. So has there been a lot that's changed in the way that marketers are approaching kind of data management, maybe who they're sharing that data with, or how what, how they're prioritizing things? I, I would be curious both from your perspective, and then also from your perspective, like what's what's changed and kind of how you guys are operating your business in this kind of post privacy perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, an important piece that I, I hope isn't lost on consumers is that the internet is free because of ads. Um, and the, the ads are there, and companies invest in those ads because they work and they perform. And really what drives them, the performance is the underlying data. So like while, yes, uh, consumers want their data protected, and that's completely reasonable, um, they, they're able to log on and access different websites for free because of this data that's driving the advertising and, and making it profitable to run ads online. So I, I feel like that's a piece of this that um, has been overlooked or at least lightly looked at because everyone's focused on like let's provide more transparency, let's uh, let's create this clear value exchange of here here's the origination of the data and it was passed through X Y Z and here's how it ended up with the ad in front of the consumer. Well, I think all of that's very important. I think part of it that I hope is not missed is, is that you're able to log onto that web page because of this whole value exchange that's happening behind the scenes. Um, so I think that's something that's very important, and, and I've had conversations with Facebook directly about that, of like, hey, I understand you're making this, why am I seeing this, this ad pop up to add more transparency into uh, exactly why consumers are targeted, but also it's an opportunity to say, hey, you're seeing this ad because the internet's free, and you're using Facebook for free because of that. Um, so I think that's a very important piece of this. Um, and then just in terms of how our, our customers have evaluated data, advertisers have never really had to grade data quality um, it was strictly on the, the publisher prior, so Facebook would sign a, a contract with us, they would grade our data quality, they would grade how we source data, the efficacy of, of what you would gather it, um, and now advertisers are having to do that, and it, it is a, the advertisers understanding what the difference between good and bad data, and, and what you should pay for good data, and what you should pay for bad data, which hopefully you're not using it. Um, hmm. Just understanding those differences, I think, is, is a massive change, and, and a lot of room for education in that. So on that point, just to just to be clear, we we often get a lot of questions, even you know, from marketers. Which, what's the difference between you know first party data or third party data? You hear all these kind of terms. Like, can you give us some layman's terms, like how you guys think about the difference? We talk a lot about you know owning your own data, but what is the difference between first party and third party data? You might put your take. Yeah, I can't wait until like the computer is here next because of this ad. The uh, really third party for me is a um, unknown aggregate source of data that provides us with some insight into, into appends or clarity or transparency and we would work with them more on the clearinghouse. Candidly, I think that that's going to be a harder business to succeed in this new world. I think there's a lot of room for improvement beyond today's structure. Um, you know, GDPR is going to rule out some bad actors. The California Protection Act is going to rule out some bad actors but they're still going to grow. Um, so third party I think is going to shift and I don't know what that's going to mean, but from a first party perspective, as an advertiser, you know, I welcome now conversations of other strategic alliances, so we're in the music business and maybe someone's in the ticketing business or someone's in the apparel or tour business. How can we team together to understand providing utility to customers and also making sure that customer data is shared across and we can make smart decisions. And so we're having a lot of conversations now of do we team up together and have a better way to market users that are going to this concert, and that's the value exchange, uh, both for consumers and for businesses. So I don't know if you call that second party, but I think that that's, um, that's going to be like the new world marching orders. So Sean, for a company that often gets bucketed in that kind of third party <laughs> data bucket, you know, hearing what Mike's saying about kind of what is the, what was the future of third party data, like what's your take on all this? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I completely agree, like I think that the, the, the line between first party owned data and third party, I guess, purchased data is going to continually blur. 
Um, and it, it, I, the way I see this kind of playing out is that we'll transact, like an Oracle data cloud will transact more so directly with the brand and license data into them to, for them to treat as their first party data. Um, and really, that's because the need for data is not going away. Um, so if you're a CPG retailer or you're a, an auto manufacturer, um, you don't control that transaction. So uh, for auto, for example, the dealership controls the data. And a lot of times that doesn't make it back up to the forwards of the world and the manufacturers. And if you're a CPG a brand, um, a lot of times the grocer owns that data and it's not making its way back into craft. Um, so a lot of times these major manufacturers of products don't have information on who their customers are. And they're still gonna need that information. So therefore, I, I think that the, the world, the, I guess the, the data environment is going to shift more so in that it, it'll be opt-in, which I think is important, so opt-in to, to data use. And then I, I view it more as moving towards a licensing front, where you license data off companies like Oracle Data Cloud, or um, Ethereum, Epsilon, Axiom, and, and you ingest that data to enrich your CRM. And, and that's kind of how I view the, the future of, of third-party data playing a role in this space. Yeah, and I, I even think from that perspective, no brand has the ability to create these warehouses of how this data gets appended, nor keep the transaction log of, oh, when did this data get onboarded and are we cleansing it properly, things like that. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity for the third-party data service providers to actually empower the shift and stop moving away from like third-party blind data into yep. a marketplace of curated data sources for your friend. Yeah, and I think kind of adding on to that, like the identity piece of like, what are you tying all that 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 data to? Are you tying it to email addresses? Like, right, is that a verified email address? So like, the, a lot of the third-party data companies, a big piece of that is the identity. So how do we match that data to a publisher? How does Oracle match an audience into Facebook? And it's it's via house like a householding process. So um, giving that identity and licensing that identity out to brands so that they can act on their data into multiple publishers. They can fulfill an audience into uh, open web, for example, it is a major role that, that we can play as well. So at Social Code, particularly with our audience intelligence platform, we get a lot of questions, which, you know, there's a lot of marketers here today. We said we were going to give you some kind of tangible takeaways, but like very high level, there's kind of three key like best practices that we would always recommend. One that both of you guys have been talking about a lot here today, which is really own your own data, right? Their first party data is always going to be the most valuable asset you have. And so um, the more you can do to build up those CRMs, build up those transaction um, files, the better it's going to be for your brand and just for um, security as well, which the, the second point, again, security is key. Be very mindful about which companies you're partnering with, who you're sharing that data with. There's a ton of, um, ton of different companies out there who have developed great capabilities as far as how to use that data, but you want to also make sure they have the right certifications. Are they SOC 2 type 2 compliant? Have they you know, been audited? Are they making sure to not you know, treat the, your customers' personally identifiable information in a non-secure way? So really make sure you're asking the right questions before you partner or send any of your data over to those companies. And then lastly, you know, act on your data quickly. There's We see over and over again with um, lots of different partners that um, one of the biggest um, areas for improved performance that we see is just acting on that data more quickly. The more you can kind of pull together that intersection between data and marketing, the better. So refresh your data. You know, th don't think about just quarterly refreshes. Think about daily refreshes, weekly refreshes, because that's you know the more you can move you know move and activate on that fresh data, you're going to see better performance. And we do see generally aggregate lift across the board, no matter who the marketer is every time they kind of are refreshing those audiences. Um, so just, I don't know if, if these kind of resonate with you guys, or is this, would this be similar advice that you would give to marketers out here? Anything I'm missing on the, the list? Yeah, I, I think definitely. Um, I'm always just like, real life examples. I'm always suspicious when someone's like, just place my tag on your site. And like, there's no agreement or anything. So understanding what people are doing with your data is even more important. And I really think that that's like part of that actors is we Ad networks or other people that are taking data and building identity graphs beyond just the consent that the users are giving them. Um, and then making sure you understand what's happening to your data as you own it. Absolutely critical. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I, I would say step one is if there's no contract, just don't even don't even humor it. Um, so if you work with like an Oracle data cloud, you'll know the contracting process is extensive, almost painfully so. But but that's for a reason. So I, I would say uh, ensure that, that um, the source, if you're buying data off third party vendors, make sure the source of the data is, is uh, viable, it is, it is legally compliant uh, and gathered in, in a compliant fashion. 
um, vet how they're storing your data if you're using third-party identity solutions, vet how they're storing it and, and what application they have of that data, if they're just piping it right through into a publisher or if, they want, if you want to model it out with third-party audiences, for example. Um, and then, yes, act on your data, absolutely. Um, so that's, that's something um, that I know the whole ecosystem is constantly looking at, is, is how do we increase the speed of refreshes? Um, for example, uh, if someone ha gets their um, credit score checked, they are immediately in market for a vehicle, a home. Um, so those type of signals, uh, the latency of the refresh is critical. Um, so when it comes down to the data, um, yes, a lot of your buyers of a specific product like retail or CPG, that won't change in aggregate over time, but the signals that you're using to make decisions, whether it's like a credit score signal or something like that, that will change drastically, and, and it's imperative that those audiences are refreshed very quickly. So let's flash forward a little bit, thinking about how do we future-proof our businesses, and you know what does the future hold? Uh, do you think that other digital platforms will follow suit with the kind of the steps that Facebook's taken? How are your companies thinking about like future-proof businesses? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a concern. So understanding how much control or even insight and transparency we can get from the major media buying platforms like. Facebook, when they're using our audiences, how they're using our audiences, frequencies against users. Um, you know, we're going to have to figure that out with them together. Um, I hope that that improves and that makes our marketing smarter and we can use frequencies across the channel to then influence other marketing efforts. Uh, on the other side, I think that the consumer experience will improve dramatically. Um, I think I, I can't wait for the day where I get less emails and ads that are targeted and things that are irrelevant. Um, and so I think. You know, there's, there's an optimal point for a user, but for as a marketer, we have to make sure that transparency is obscured from us as we go down this path. Yeah, I think um, further understanding how to grade data is very important going forward. Anyone can name an audience anything, um, and really understanding what's in that audience and the quality of it and being able to prove that, I think is kind of critical for, for long-term data application. Um, so that's something that, that I think is, is pretty, a, a, a data, a Data grading currency, I think, uh, that everyone kind of agrees upon and values, I think is something that's critical in the industry for um, data use and applications. Um, and then I think there will be more regulation coming down the pipe. Um, I think more platforms will follow uh, Facebook suit in terms of having data providers, third-party data providers work directly with the brands. Um, but I think, that's, I think that's all moving to an evolution of, of brands licensing data and moving towards kind of a, a first-party blurred world um, where it is the advertiser creating it and, and buying it directly from data providers. And what about today's children who kind of grew up with their parents sharing their information on social platforms from day one and you know just this kind of environment of sharing so much of themselves like do you think that they have an awareness of once you get into more of that kind of corporate lens how how their data and information is such a valuable asset and how it might be used? It's going to be embarrassing for them. <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, so I think that might be the next like larger shift. Of their now uh, their likes and share without their consent, and you know it, everything is out there for everybody. Um, that might become more of a concern. I think in the future as, as those customers come online and their spending habits pick up, um, it's, it's going to get interesting where consent becomes a lot more important. Right. Yeah. Like your whole life is documented, like from baby pictures through when you're an adult now. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, uh, having some form of consent or some way to control, like, hey, after five years, I want these things pulled down. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I do think that from the consumer lens, that having more control over your data use and application um, will be something that, that happens, and potentially at the browser level. So uh, Safari or a Chrome, um, allowing you to control exactly what levers uh, different publishers can access. Um, but I, I think that is a ways off in terms of the actionable and agreed upon across the, the entire industry. And probably a lot more job opportunities too. There's going to be a huge need for people who understand data, how to use it, for good and not evil. So thank you everyone. Uh, please continue the conversation with us. Um, Sean, Mike, and I will all be around for a little bit afterwards. So thanks for sharing your time with us.